Don't call her Ruth. Do not call her Ruth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or justice. Yeah, or justice skin for yeah. Like they're they're a rule, and it doesn't bother her, but her staff gets pissed. <laughs>
really slide that you know we're inspired by. You know, it's really important for Holly Murray to to you know be in the film and her character because she was you know she birthed the civil rights movement um, with Thurgood Marshall and. Um, Dorothy Kenyon, and uh, when they won this case, she put their names on the brief. Of all the periods of time, I mean, I, this might just sort of be like an easy answer, but why this period of our life? What is it about this period of our life that you felt like, you know, this is going to pack the most powerful punch of anything that we can show people who don't really know much about her? Yeah, well, there's a couple of answers to that question. Uh, it's, it's, it was the first case they ever tried together, the first and last. Um, which, you know, and then the other reason is, it is, is it a, it's a case that overturned 178 different laws. Uh, you know, and it was, a, it, it was a very prominent case that set the course for Ruth's career, for her journey in fighting for equal rights. She, um, you know, she made this, uh, we all know she made the, this world, you know, better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, this is very much a love story, as you just witnessed, in, in that the, the love story was, was really a metaphor for this film. And it was really, it, it was just the right case to start with. Because she even asked, why aren't we doing a story about I, you know, I, I've tried so many um, uh, cases in, in the Supreme Court. I argued so many cases. Why this one? Because it was the first one. Right, yeah. And it was, uh, it, it set everything in motion. Well, so if you're, you're having to play a real life person, obviously there's, you know, there's materials, there's, there's prep you can really do. But to try to play a real life person and work with the family, like, what was that like for you? It, it was convenient. <laughs> uh, because I had Daniel there, I had to go, hey, uh, so your uncle, you know, what do you think about this kind of thing? And go, wow, he hated it. Go, okay, good to know. Yeah, so that, that was really convenient. But, you know, Martin was with a very public figure, you know, Justice Ginsburg. He really didn't want to be a public figure. Uh, so I didn't have the same level of pressure or responsibility that Felicity may have had. You know, I mean, she was playing an incredibly recognizable and venerated and respected person. A lot of people, if she didn't get it right, which we all know that she did, but if she didn't get it right, someone would go, no, Ruth actually, you know, whatever, whatever. But, but no one outside of their circle of friends or, you know, his students or whatever, no one really knew Martin, so I could really do whatever the hell I wanted. <laughs> yeah, maybe in terms of looking for the perfect Ruth, what was it about Felicity Jones? Let's hear it for Felicity Jones. What made her perfect Well, she was the perfect Ruth. She just she goes very deep and into her into her characters. When um, when we were casting her, I just kept looking at the young RPG pictures and her, and I felt that there was such a similarity. And I just I had a hunch. I just felt that she could step into these shoes, you know, just full on and just take it. And she, you know, studied her walk, studied her talk. And, you know, it was really interesting. There were no transcripts for the young RBG voice. You know, there's the RBG that we know, you know, from her Supreme Court arguments and, of course, her swearing in. But there's, you know, a woman's voice or a woman or man's voice is very different in your 20s and 30s than in your, you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so, you know, we never set out to do an impersonation, and um, RBG was very pleased. And I just knew Felicity goes deep, and she went deep, as did Army over here. And, you know, you never know when chemistry's gonna really hold, if it's gonna work. You know, individually, you've got great actors. But it was magic. What was it about? About Felicity, like, like when the first the first time you met and you just like you know, oh yeah, we got this guy, you know, we got the chemistry, we got this guy. Yeah, you know, I mean, chemistry really just comes from, from a feeling of security and, and trust. And so we just spent a lot of time together and got to know each other and ask each other tough questions about each other and it really kind of felt each other out. But the thing that was the most impressive for me with Felicity is 
whenever you're rehearsing for a movie and you've got all the actors together and the director and you're all kind of there in a room, you'll sit there for hours and you kind of go over scene and line by line, word by word, you argue about every piece of punctuation or you, you kind of go over everything. And what happens invariably is like one person will kind of go and just close their script. And that is sort of like a nonverbal cue and maybe another person will see it and they'll kind of like put their pen in their pocket and maybe they'll close their script or someone might be really tenacious and even put their script in the bag and you kind of get the vibe that everyone's trying to wrap it up which happens every single time because they have to end at some point. Anyway, it was never Felicity. She was never the first one to end a rehearsal. And if you try to close your script really suddenly, she would look at you and go, actually, let's talk about this relationship. Right <laughs> right yeah, 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 no, good, good call, good call, good call. Yeah, that's it, right, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she was one of the most dedicated and hardworking actors that I've ever had the pleasure of doing a scene with. She never seemed to get tired. She never seemed to slack off. She never phoned anything in. You know, she was incredibly dedicated, and the work that she does really shows that. What kind of prep did she have to do on her end? Uh, you know, and, and did she did she have a lot of time with Ruth beforehand, or did she maybe just not want to hear until after? Because some no. people different. Yeah, yeah, no, she had you know plenty of prep in terms of listening to um, you know hundreds of hours of. You know, take you know the la the latter that Ruth Bader is living in today. Um, I had gone and met her early on, and you know worked with Daniel on the script to in inject a lot of truisms. You know, and when then I then I brought Arnie and Felicity to meet um, to meet RBG in her chambers, and that was quite a meeting because. RBG couldn't keep her eyes off of Arnie. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yeah, I'm never going to pay for another speeding ticket yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, like, I mean, what looks like for you to just like walk into our chambers and be like, man, this shit just got real, you know? Yeah, well, you, you have, have to go to the Supreme Court in D.C., then you have to go through, you know, I don't know they're like, U.S. Marshals or whoever does the security for the Supreme Court, they're all there and they patch down and do the warrant and they're getting there. You know, no, no phone calls or nothing to be cool about this guy. You know, kind of Don't thing. call her Ruth. Do not call her Ruth. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, justice. yeah, yeah. yeah. Or justice. Yeah, yeah. Or justice. Yeah, or justice. Yeah, like they're, they're a rule. And it doesn't bother her, but her staff gets pissed. <laughs> so you, you kind of have to. And then you wait there, you're waiting outside in private chambers, and then someone will come and go, the justice is ready for you. And you go, okay, okay. And then you walk through the door, and it's this huge office. The ceilings are 18 feet tall. Her desk is enormous. It's almost the size in front of this theater. And then there's this little tiny woman just standing there. It's like, whoa, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, uh, yeah, last year at Sundance, you know, she was there, and, and it was like, she was like a rock star, obviously, and that's the whole purpose of the RBG movie. Um, and I, I said, hi, Ruth, and she ignored me. Now I go on. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Next time, yeah. I got you. Know, if you ever have a case to go to the Supreme Court, you're fucked, dude. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, did you, what did you film this movie? We filmed it um, in the end of 2017. We started filming, and then the Harvey Weinstein story broke. Yeah. Okay. And so we knew it was really timely before we, you know, before we even started the film and then it became even more timely. Isn't that crazy though how that happens? Like, like, like you'll, you'll start, start working on something, something and then something, something will happen to me. Something that's already, what well, you know, the story was, was more, it was already more timely and relevant now than it was back then. But yeah. like, then it happened. And, you know, she's been, so, you know, she's like a real, obviously a champion, but she's a hero, she's like a superhero. But one of the things that struck me about this film is the way that that Ruth and Martin elevated each other. They had each other's backs. They made each other laugh. They truly, truly, truly loved each other. Um, let's talk about making sure 
you preserve that aspect of their relationship for us? Yeah, well, it was, you know, it was a revolutionary relationship in the 50s, as Army said. It was, it was, you know, relationships like that really happened in the 50s. And theirs was truly that. And they loved each other deeply. And I don't know what, you know, it's interesting to think about if there was no Marty, where would RBG be today? You know, I think about that a lot. I think she'd still be RBG, but it may be, you know, but it, you know, the love of family and the support of a, of a family, whether it's your family or a family you make, um, is, is everything, is everything. And it was everything to her, and, and still is. Um, and when you go into her house, you, her apartment, you see, you know, Marty was, Marty did the cooking, she did the thinking. And uh, even though he became one of the preeminent tax attorneys in the country, there's all his pots on on the kitchen wall. You know, there he is. He is so present in that house. And then even when you walk into that chambers, and it was in her chambers, and that's why it was so important when when she met Army. I mean, it was very important for her to obviously meet Felicity, the woman who was portraying her. But her connection with her husband was deep. And he supported her. She supported him unconditionally, and and that's rare. Let's talk about that. Uh, I just because I'm just so fascinated how how she was already obsessed with you. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, just uh, you know, I'm not worried about just gotta get along right. Like how did how did you work together to make that make sure that happened? Um, you know, the justice was very open about her dynamic with Marty and how much she credits him with whatever successes she had in life because he was like a buttress to her who helped facilitate her success and if that meant that he had to stay home and cook and clean and do all that so that she would have time and energy to focus on what she needed to focus on, he would do it. And, you know, she was incredibly appreciative of, of everything that they were able to achieve and accomplish together. You know, they were greater than the sum of their parts. Um, so for Felicity and I, we just wanted to make sure that, and you know, we, we got really lucky, actually, uh, because Daniel Stiegelman, who wrote the movie, is Ruth and Marty's nephew. If anybody else would have written this movie, we would have ended up with sort of like an Aaron Sorkin courtroom drama all about the Denver 10th Court of Appeals. Uh, Aaron, you're not here anyway. Yeah. Not with the same Yeah. Because that would be a great movie, too. Just in case, yeah. Uh, but, but we had Daniel who, who wanted to show the behind the scenes of it. And it was so clear and evident, not only in the script, but in all the source material we had, but the nature of their relationship and what made it feel so special and aspirational. You know, um, I, I would want to have more of that relationship with my wife, who I think is smarter than I am. You know, uh, so it just, it just seemed like you couldn't tell the story of. Ruth at the time, now Justice Ginsburg, and her husband Martin, without including this very special aspect of their relationship in it. And a lot of it was there on the page, and then we also all worked together to flesh it out and bring it to life. You mentioned how, how impressed you were with the way Felicity was practicing and rehearsing with you. What impressed both of you during the film, like when you were actually doing principal photography of this minute? Like what was it about working with her during that time that, that surprised you really made you think, like, wow, she's like the real deal. Well, you know, the moment you roll the camera on her, she just came alive and she stayed in character the entire time. And, and so there was just every moment of it was extraordinary, you know, and exciting and filled with passion. And that doesn't always happen when you're filming. It's like, oh my goodness, you know what? How can we get this when it's not working? But it, it was working. She, she really embodied her. She uh, really came alive. And, uh, you know, with not too much trickery, you know, she did put some teeth. She, uh, she put a little, what were they called? Uh, she she put her teeth. Yeah, she called me and, and, and asked me, what if we put some, you know, uh, caps on my teeth. I was like, silent on the phone, like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, we're, we're screwed. You know, 
And then I just, you know, sat there, my inner voice, my inner voice, and I said, okay, let's let's think about that, you know. And then we tried them, and they just filled her mouth out a little bit, um, like the justices. And I never have spoken about that. I only recently have spoken about that when she actually spoke about it. What about you? What impressed you the most about, like, wow, film? Um, she, she would wear headphones uh, during, you know, lunch or, or after rap, and, you know, you'd say, you know, what are you listening to? She'd go, what? Uh, what, what, are you, what are you listening to? And it was either one of two answers. <clears throat> it was either Beyonce or <laughs> speeches of Ruth that she had given. So, yeah. That's a, you know, yeah. either or. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I want to open up to the audience if you have questions. And, and you know, since you're in the front row, this is what I love to do for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I was very impressed with the uh, uh, seeming impact that Jane had on Ruth as well. Can you speak to you know how you worked with her? Um, you know, how much impact did she have on on the film? Well, I actually never worked with Jane. Uh, you know, Daniel. You know, was really kind of stuck when he was writing this and he asked, you know, the justice, you know, how do I write Jane? And she said, well, just look at Clara, her, her daughter. And so he took inspiration from Clara, who also graduated from her. Uh, and uh, that's, that's uh, that was the inspiration for Jane. And, um, you know, Jane was like, was I, you know, was I really, you know, like that when I was young? And, and, and Ruth Gary Ginsburg went, yes. <laughs> you know. Who else has a question? Yes, I just saw one. Yes, right here. Wait, wait. Okay. Second row. That qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and she loves the film. 
and she's proud of it, which is really everything. Uh, I just want to ask, you know, because the movie, like Mike like Harmon pointed out, it's it's not like just a courtroom drama. It's it has a big heart. Uh, it is also very very inspiring. Um, what do you? What's the biggest? Because there's a few, but what is sort of like the biggest takeaway that you hope people take after seeing this movie? It's your movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is a movie about how change happens. And I hope the takeaway is that we can all make change. You know, we can all fight for what we believe in. You know, and we can all live the lives we choose to live. And she chose to make this world a better place for all of us, a freer place. Um, and, you know, the big takeaway is you can do anything in this world. You can, you know, stand up, that you have a voice. And this, you asked me earlier, this movie's about RBG becoming an RBG, and that's why we chose that point in her life. Um, and so that's the takeaway. I mean, her legacy speaks for itself. Yeah, for, for sure. The other takeaway, ladies and gentlemen, is this. So now that the movie is, is nationwide, you spread the word on you know, social media, right? Yeah. That's how you do reviews these things, and really. So make sure you go on Facebook, go on Instagram, Go on Twitter, right? If you're still using MySpace, <laughs> knock yourself out. Yeah. Please use really your on job. LinkedIn. <laughs> or, or, you know, friends, whatever it takes, but do spread the word out on the basis of sex. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you guys very much. Enjoy your